your host, Linda Ivory Green, Director of the Division of Community Health and Wellness with the Jersey City Department of Health and Human Services. Joining me is my co-host, Mrs. Sharnia Williams of the Jersey City Medical Center, Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health. You may be wondering, what is Health Beat? Well, since this is our first segment, I'm going to share with you exactly what it is. HealthBeat is the platform where we strive to keep the community on the pulse of topics affecting our physical, mental, social, environmental, and financial health. An easier way to say this is just to describe it as health and all policies programming. Each 30-minute segment will feature community partners providing you with current and relevant health information. It's our goal to not only provide a venue where we create awareness of the various public health issues which really impact our daily lives, but also to educate and cultivate a healthier community. Mm -hmm. Of course, this work cannot be done without really strong partnerships. So at this time, it's my distinct pleasure to mm -hmm. introduce to you my co-host, Mrs. Sharnia Williams, a key figure for patient and community support with the St. Barnabas Jersey City Medical Center. Hi, Sharnia. Welcome. Just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, Linda. Hello, everyone. I'm Sharnia Williams, Patient Navigation and Outreach, Man Outreach Manager at Jersey City Medical Center. In my role, we help the community with addressing their health barriers. We link them to appropriate resources and ensure they have the support while addressing their health needs. For this segment of Health Beat, we will focus on the topics of COVID and flu, as well as social resources and services within the community. And clearly, there is no escaping the obvious. So we're going to get right to it with how COVID-19 has come into all of our lives. And so we'll be right back with our first guest. And now, as we turn our attention to COVID-19, for the last several months, the world as we know it has been forever changed. We have been under attack from an invisible enemy, the coronavirus, AKA COVID-19. The pandemic has affected and infected millions across the globe. But let's take a look locally at what the impact has been. Our Department of Health and Human Services led the city in its response efforts. So I would like to take this time now to introduce you to our first guest, Stacy Flanagan, <laughs> who is the director. How are you? <laughs> I'm well, <laughs> the director for the Department of Health and Human Services here in Jersey City. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you. I'm glad to be here on our first health beat. Yes. Uh, it's really exciting uh, to see where we take the next chapter. Exactly. My first question, and I know you have tons of information for our viewers, is what was the city's response? What was the Department of Health and Human Services response to the pandemic? Well, I will start by saying, uh, you know, the city did not stop. You might even be hearing some noise outside as we're talking because we not only addressed the virus, but we kept the city moving. Right. Uh, first, you know, we started by pivoting staff mm -hmm. to support uh, the effort in contact tracing. Right. We slowly started seeing more cases, and we then took a team of staff, and we started testing locally. We opened up two testing sites, a walk-up, a drive-through, did some pop-up sites, all while we were doing this, we also started thinking about the mental health impact. Uh, we started seeing issues in our immigrant population of people losing their jobs, not qualifying for benefits. At the same time, those that were losing their jobs and qualifying for benefits took so long mm -hmm. that people literally were starving. Um, and we had a serious hunger uh, issue. So we started working to provide meals. Uh, in addition to what we already do, Meals on Wheels, our congregate meal sites, we started delivering meals to individuals. So I do think that from testing to support services, contact tracing, 
mental health referrals, increased information and knowledge that we put out on our Twitter, hashtag HealthierJC, um, increased information about what our partners were also doing during this time. Yeah, as you know, many of our nonprofits you know, were closed because they serve youth or seniors, and these were vulnerable populations that we just couldn't you know, um, you know, have out in group work. And so we started uh, working with the governor's office to make sure we didn't have a lot of activities across our city. That's slowly changing as we're seeing some increase, uh, we're making some decisions around activities each and every day. Wow, and yes, I know firsthand <laughs> the work that the health department has been doing, but what do you think in all of that, because it was a hub of, of activity, constant activity, um, what do you think are some of the lessons that we've learned um, as a city. Yeah, lessons a learned. Uh, I do think uh, stronger policies mm. uh, around uh, group activities, uh, greater information about knowing who we're serving. Uh, you know, that's one thing we're seeing in contact tracing. We're not getting all the information that we really want to really understand all of the people that are sick right now. Because we call them up and they're like, oh, I don't really feel comfortable um, sharing that. Uh, information. So we also know that we have more work to do mm -hmm. on the issues of health equity. And I think you know that mm -hmm. firsthand. Our mental health work, uh, the increase we've seen in violence, mm -hmm. domestic violence, or the stressors that come out of the mental health of not being able to leave the home that are exacerbated and reactivity that we're seeing in individuals. Um, I myself have experienced slightly higher blood pressure than I'd like. Uh, <laughs> I think we've all and so everybody's <laughs> everybody yes. has something um, that they're dealing with during this virus. Not one person mm -hmm. can say this virus didn't impact them. That's something that unites us, that makes us, you know, know that we're all in this together. But the ways people are impacted can be much greater in one neighborhood than another. Mm -hmm. Access to food, access to the supermarket that offer senior hours, mm -hmm. um, access to private cars versus public transportation. So what we've learned and what I'm really excited about with the additional work we've been doing alongside VIA and the work that the health department's been thinking about around really what are the equalizers that we can bring to the table? How do we get you know, stronger partnerships and dealing with the trauma that this virus has left behind. Uh, and so really thinking through how do we become more strategic um, and really um, leveraging the chief public health strategist vision that uh, the health department has for the future. What do you think, how do you think basically, are we better prepared now well besides having you know a whole host of masks right <laughs> one for every outfit um we actually better understand and this is something that i think when we're doing service delivery we don't often think about the logistics behind the service delivery you mm -hmm. order and you expect it to come and you know what in the beginning of this process we had on order months prior mm -hmm. Um, a significant amount of um, personal protective equipment, right. uh, the PPE, the masks, the hand sanitizer, the gloves, mm -hmm. and it was held up due mm -hmm. to basic logistics, supply chain management. Right. Uh, this also impacted people just getting simple things like toilet paper. And so we, we are better prepared now because one, the city, you know, we have an amazing Office of Emergency Management. It's been stockpiling uh, PPE for the future. Uh, we are rolling out a series of campaigns and education. I mean, Health Beats is one, but we've got a ward-based education program uh, where we are gonna have you know, our staff just really reactivate with our neighborhood uh, associations. And we're making sure that everybody better understands that washing your hands and wearing a mask are the two key things in fighting this virus. You know, the third is obviously social distancing and activities that you uh, encounter or attend. 
but we are uh, rolling out a mask up campaign. So hashtag mask up JC. And, uh, you know, mid November, every household in the city will receive a packet of masks. Uh, we've been coordinating that with the Office of Innovation. And so uh, I really believe that with all of our uh, city agencies coming together, we have, you know, really uh, informative discussions across departments on how do we, you know, work better with the recreation and youth development? How does the Office of Cultural Affairs work stronger with our health officer to make sure people are safer? These are the pieces of the puzzle that we feel like we're much more prepared now, mm -hmm. um, that we are now all in sync uh, and we've all kind of gone through the initial impact of how that impacted one ourselves, two our family and three our community uh, that we have you know, put on our, our own uh, you know, mask mm -hmm. and are now ready to help others. I'm quite sure though our viewers are wondering because now we're at a point where you're, we're discussing COVID-19 and we are also in flu season. Oh, the twin demic. <laughs> the twin demic, absolutely. So, what are the city's efforts in that, in, in addressing and responding to our twin demic? Yeah, so we, <laughs> we kicked off on October 1st, and we like to do this every year with a large senior gathering because, you know, we really respect that a large part of our population are seniors. We normally do a, a large health fair, your team, you know, right. uh, involved in that uh, to plan. And so this time we, we really couldn't do a large scale right. event. So we started neighborhood by neighborhood and we hosted COVID testing alongside flu shots. We thought that this was a really great way to say to someone, come and get tested because we know you want your flu shot. And if you know that you're not COVID positive, but you start getting these feelings, that might be flu related from your shot, you would actually feel more secure. Right. Uh, so we started that. In fact, today uh, we have our team downstairs at City Hall right. and uh, they just emailed me to tell me that they did a few dozen seniors uh, with okay. flu shots, COVID tests. And starting today, we just rolled out the employee campaign. Mm -hmm. So uh, first we're gonna start with the employees and then we're gonna work with our local hospitals to push out a twindemic campaign mm -hmm. uh, that uh, al aligns with our mask up campaign. So if you don't see, you know, get your flu shot, get your COVID test, wear your mask. These are the three things that we're just gonna continue to, to share. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many places where you can get your flu shot, right. um, whether you have insurance or not. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. our city clinic is open and we've got, you know, partners mm -hmm. throughout the city. So we're going to post uh, a listing of where you can get your flu shots. That's great. Because basically at this time, it is a double-edged sword and we, are, we have to address both. Mm -hmm. um, you're, we're talking about vulnerable populations, um, our underserved communities. So it's important that everyone follow that. It's important that everyone wear their mask, social distance, please wash your hands in order to, because we're seeing an uptick in numbers. Well, we often see people that say, you know what, I kind of don't feel well today. I'm going to go to work anyway. And we're just saying, please don't. Yes. Um, <laughs> and that's why we were the first in the state to pass sick leave, right? right. We really thought you earn sick leave. You right. deserve those days to stay home. If you're not getting that from your employer, let us know. Um, we can help you because we believe Absolutely. that this is, you know, one of the ways that we, you know, prepared for viruses like this. Absolutely. Well, Stacy. Thank you, and thank you so much for sharing with us at HealthBeat. I know our viewers will take this information and will, they'll share it, but if you need anything else, um, our website is there, and you can always get the information from our website. So thank you so very much. With all that is going on, I'm sure we'll have you back on HealthBeat <laughs> to provide us with some additional information. Again, thank you so much. Well, it was great being here, Linda, and I think you're doing an amazing job with your team. Uh, Sharnia, I'm so happy to see this partnership with the Jersey City Medical Center, Barnabas, and um, I look forward to sharing more exciting information uh, about what we're doing across the city. Thank you.
Joining us today is Dr. Kara, Chair of Medicine and Chief Population Officer with Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health Jersey, Jersey City Medical Center. Dr. Kara, today we would like to talk a little bit about population health and its impact and its role within COVID. Can you talk to us a little bit about what that looked like at Jersey City Medical Center? Yeah, sure, sure. So th thanks for having me, uh, Sharnia. Uh, look, I mean, I think uh, population health was there long before COVID came. Mm -hmm. Elements like uh, health disparity, health inequity was there long, long before COVID came. Uh, but COVID did something. Mm. Uh, COVID uh, almost blew the cover. It unmasked, it magnified, it, it truly uh, pulled from under the stone Mm -hmm. uh, under the roughs, things that were hidden. And one of the things that was hidden was uh, health inequity, you know, yeah. disparities in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So uh, the unfair practices in health, the avoidable uh, practices in healthcare, the, the disparities that exist in the way we practice medicine, the way we deliver medicine, our policies, our, uh, our access to healthcare, all of that, mm -hmm. uh, all of the disparities in that and the, the, the favoring of one versus the other, how the dice rolls for one community versus the other, uh, that whole process was unmasked right. in some ways by COVID or magnified, I should say, by COVID. I'm sure, I'm sure. Uh, so, so suddenly uh, in, the, in the midst of the pandemic, we faced not just a healthcare crisis, but a human crisis, an equity crisis mm -hmm. uh, that we had not seen before. Uh, so the, the fact that you know, the mortality rate in blacks will be 50% 50, 50 more, in Latinx and indigenous population, the death rate from COVID will be 50% more. It's no accident. It, it's, it's years and years of of structured and structural uh, racism, mm -hmm. our policies, and the way we do things, that got us there. Uh, the, the fact that you know, 65% uh, of people who cannot work from home right. are black, Latinx, and indigenous people. Mm -hmm. These people who don't have the privilege to work from home. The fact that 65% of black families have at least one person who, if there's a second surge, will still not be able to work from home. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. That's inequity. So uh, uh, the safety net that we had built, or so we thought we had built, uh, was suddenly dismantled by right. COVID. Uh, children, uh, schools. Uh, schools were not just in educational places. Millions and millions of children uh, get food. Mm -hmm. get their breakfast and their lunch from schools. So suddenly, not only were they sitting at home and trying to figure out how to learn, they didn't have breakfast and lunch. Right. So uh, a safety net built around schools fell apart. Mm -hmm. uh, Elderly patients and you, you know, we managed the, the many people. You know, right. I recall the elderly patient who lived on the fourth floor, didn't mm -hmm. have access to food, uh, is an elderly black man. It, it didn't happen today. Right. It happened over years and years, but COVID just unmasked that whole thing. Definitely. Uh, so the safety net, the social fabric, the inequity, the disparities in healthcare, on how we do things, uh, was just unmasked by COVID. So population health, uh, you know, the way I see it is, is, is an umbrella. It's that common watering hole where healthcare providers, healthcare systems, policy makers, community makers, government, privates, all of them come together as a partner. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we are going to f fix this, it has to be done at a community level, right. at a state level, at a national level, and it, it, it starts small. And that partnership is what population health is. Mm -hmm. It's ensuring not just the quality of care for one person, not just the cost of care for one person, but really the health of a population. Mm -hmm. uh, so the way I see it is if, if, if COVID has unmasked something, uh, it is 
that in our health we need to have an approach uh, that's centered on population health, right. that that fights systemic racism in and health disparity, uh, that makes access. Uh, so one in four people lost jobs. So uh, we know that the mental health impact mm -hmm. of COVID is just coming. Absolutely. You know, in a survey a few weeks ago, 49% of, I believe 50% of Americans reported feeling stressed and anxious. Mm -hmm. uh, if one in four are unemployed, we know that mental health, depression, suicide is the next wave that will come. Right. Uh, to manage that is, is you need a community. You need a partnership. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's where population health comes in. So uh, the, the way I see it is, is uh, population health was always there. Uh, our broken system, so to speak, uh, right. the inequities were there, always there, hundreds of years. But, but COVID has just uh, suddenly uh, shown the light on that and magnified it. Right. But it also gives us an opportunity that if we, if we build the right coalition and we take the right approach centered on population, uh, and fight health disparity, uh, we can overcome this. Uh, we can overcome this collectively, mm -hmm. but it just needs a paradigm shift. It needs a huge uh, metanoic shift uh, in how we've done things and, and how we need to do it. Absolutely. I think some of what I'm hearing from you, you know, you're really touching on the social determinants of health. Um, and I'm sure during this time, especially, you really had the opportunity to see some of the barriers that many of our patients and community members experience. Do you want to touch a little bit on that and share with us some of the things that maybe, you know, the, the takeaway from it? Yeah. Uh, so, so really, again, going back to what it has unmasked, mm -hmm. the, the, the social determinants of health, uh, again, were always there. Right. Uh, our race ethnicity, a language, the address, the zip code, uh, how much money I make, income disparities, mm -hmm. uh, do I have a home to live or not, do I have access to food or not, uh, what kind of place do I live in. Right. Uh, and geography was, in a very subtle way, but obvious way for years, uh, a destiny. Mm -hmm. So the fact that uh, over 49% of very poor communities don't have enough ICU beds is no accident. There's no accident. So if, if a second surge comes, those communities will hurt again. Mm. And those are the very communities that struggle with access to food, housing, income. Uh, they are of, they're black, Latinx, indigenous, right. colored people. Uh, so social determinants of health is an extremely important but difficult to measure attribute of health. Mm -hmm. We can say that almost greater than 60 to 70 percent of health is determined by the social determinants. Right. Uh, access to food. So if the safety net of schools went away and we gave children an average of, I don't know, I think it's under six dollars, five dollars, seventy-five cents for breakfast and lunch, mm -hmm. the kind of food you get from with that money is not healthy food. Right. And that promotes let's say, childhood obesity. Mm -hmm. So right there is another example of uh, a social determinant that seeds, sows the seeds for future health issues. Right. Uh, there's a new term out there, you know, it's, 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 uh, and I really like it a lot. It's called, uh, we used to measure healthcare quality, healthcare cost, patient experience. Uh, we should now measure ourselves by an ability to what they call uh, epidemic mitigation. Mm -hmm. Our ability to overcome and fight epidemics as a community. Because this is, this might be the biggest, it might not be the last. Right. We don't even know how long this one will last. Right. So how we overcome that will measure the success and the strength and resilience of a society and the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and sewn within that fabric of, of that community are social determinants. Right. And, and you know, you and me, we, we, when we were at the peak of the pandemic, we mm -hmm. were taking care of patients. Yes. We were taking care of elderly patients who were alone at home. Mm -hmm. uh, we, were, we were taking care of patients who were bidding a farewell to their loved ones mm -hmm. over, a, over a screen. Um, uh, we took care of patients who we quote unquote discharged home because we had to. The hospitals were full and I, I just, uh, amazing work we did, but we had to. Uh, 
and these patients were going home to a, a, a vulnerable fabric. Absolutely. Uh, so, uh, so if if we are going to be successful in fighting this pandemic successfully and be ready for future mitigation of epidemics and pandemics, it has to come from the lens of population health and social determinants. Mm -hmm. uh, and our uh, Barnabas and Jersey City Medical Center is big on this. You know, our CEO, uh, Mr. Ostrowski, uh, uh, made this a central theme mm -hmm. of the way we do business, of the way we do uh, our work, is right. addressing social determinants of health. Otherwise, we will, not only will we not succeed, we will not have a community uh, that will be conducive to healthy and happy living. Absolutely. Just want to see if we could take some time, you know, obviously COVID's impact has changed how we engage with our community, even using this platform now as a means to provide information. Could you talk a little bit about Jersey City Medical Center's efforts um, to provide health education and, and health management to patients, whether it be virtually or telemed? Can you speak a little bit about yeah. those efforts? Yeah. So, you know, I came to Jersey City last year in, in October, and, and I little, bit, little could I imagine that you know, in, in six months' time, uh, the way I will, uh, I'll conduct 80 to 90 percent of my interactions would be on a screen. Mm -hmm. If someone had told me then that we will be doing telehealth the way we are doing and we'll be seeing patients and talking to patients uh, in six months' time, I would say that would refer the patient for someone, to, you know, like a patient that you need your head checked out. <laughs> but six months later, that's exactly what we did. Yeah. We had patients who were, uh, again, I said this earlier, bidding farewell to their loved ones in another state over a flat screen. Right. Uh, and human emotions, uh, they were able to touch each other through that screen. Mm -hmm. uh, so in many, many ways, you know, CMS, uh, the, 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 the Zarina of CMS, uh, Dr. Burma, you know, she, uh, she has said, in many ways, uh, the genie has left the bottle. So telehealth as a way and virtual health mm -hmm. as a medium is out. Right. It's the way we will do a lot of our work. And Jersey City Medical Center and Barnabas as a system, uh, rapidly, in a matter of uh, days and weeks, we shifted. Mm -hmm. And it's really a testament to our, the way humans can evolve and a system can evolve so quickly. A matter of days and weeks, we shifted uh, the way we see patients, the way we send them home. And you were part of the transition care program. Right. You know, on a screen, we were seeing them at home. We were walking around behind screens and seeing how they're doing at home. Mm -hmm. You know, show us what you got. Show us that little sort of rash you have on the screen. Right. And there was satisfaction. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, we did that. Uh, policies are still being put in place that will make this an effective uh, solution, mm -hmm. you know, not just in delivering health but financially and for providers to engage in. Uh, obviously, there's a huge learning curve as we do this. You mm -hmm. know, there's a new term that we talk to our residents about called website manners. You know, we used to have mm -hmm. bedside manners, mm -hmm. and now we have uh, we have website manners. <laughs> uh, the, so, so humans to suddenly communicate over a screen especially when you have uh, uh, diagnosis and conditions and conversations uh, that you want to be face to face, right. it's not easy. So right. uh, many of our trainees, many of our doctors, myself, we didn't learn that way. Mm -hmm. But suddenly we are conducting care that way. Right. Uh, so uh, we need to learn. We need to understand how as a tool we use it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other thing is, on the other side, how many patients have access to that? You right. know, while 70% of Americans do have a a uh, smartphone, uh, not all of them are fluent in using it. Mm -hmm. And we saw that mm -hmm. when we were managing patients. They didn't know how to put the camera on or right. they had a flip phone. So it was not even visual, it mm -hmm. was just telephonic health. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's an evolutionary path to this. There is a care delivery redesign that needs to happen in the front line mm -hmm. on how we deliver care. Especially as we think we are entering a second surge, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, we we need to figure out you know who will we see and who will we not. Right. Um, and then there is what we are now calling the spillover effect. You know these are people who had regular conditions. They needed their mammogram, their colonoscopy, had heart attacks, strokes. A lot of that care shifted. Right. Uh, 
So there is bound to be a spillover effect of that in the months and years to come. We don't know it yet, but it'll come. Right. So how do we shift virtual and telehealth in that direction mm -hmm. so that care does not fall through the gap? And then you do a lot of community events through the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, colonoscopy education, mammogram education, so we are shifting. Mm -hmm. But it's, 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 a, it's something that we'll never go back to business right. as usual. It is the new normal, quote unquote new normal, uh, but there's a learning curve. There's Absolutely. a policy curve, there is a financial uh, arrangement, there is a whole lot of process that needs to happen on how we'll get paid and how we'll... Uh, but I think it's all going in the right direction. I mean, it looks like it is, it's going to be... A, so from our side, you know, as a healthcare organization and as a provider, as a, as a doc, mm -hmm. uh, we need to redesign the way we do business. Absolutely. On how we... How we so the telehealth is a huge opportunity, mm -hmm. but it just needs it's like a new modality, we just need to learn it and how right. to use it. But I think it's beautiful, I think used effectively, it is the one tool we have to cross the geographic and zip code boundaries of mm -hmm. health. You know, the, it's a actually an effective tool in fighting health disparity if you use it right, right? If you use it right, so we can get access to so many more people remote people mm -hmm. who are living, we can fight loneliness, you know, loneliness in the elderly. You know, like my mother is at home now, nine months with COVID. She's, she's going insane. Yeah. So virtual media has offered her the ability to connect to her family and her grandchildren. Right. And the same thing with our patients that we took mm -hmm. care of. You know, the docs would FaceTime her and talk to her. Yeah. So there's a huge opportunity, huge opportunity. But there's a learning curve and there's a policy curve. So I think virtual health is here to stay. Telehealth is here to stay. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are a few things that we need to learn, uh, website manners I touched upon, uh, but I think it's beautiful. It's a new day and innovative way to deliver care. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm uh, very, very uh, optimistic about that. Thank you. I think, you know, the takeaway from this is we always talk about looking at um, healthcare outside of the four walls, right? And we talk about population health is not just what happens within the hospital, but what you've spoken to really speaks really highlights the partnerships. Yeah. It really highlights the importance of essentially keeping up with the times, right? Whether it be utilizing these telemedicine platforms, et cetera. So I want to thank you, Dr. Kara, for taking some time to chat with us today. Um, and I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Thank you, Sharni. Thank you for focusing on this. I appreciate that. Thank, thank you. you. Next up, Linda will be back with Mr. Julio Garcia, Executive Director of PACO, to enlighten us on how their organization has helped its constituents during this pandemic. As we discuss COVID-19 and the pandemic, um, it's, we have to talk about communities that have been greatly impacted or individuals who have been impacted by the pandemic itself. And when you look at individuals and communities, uh, you have to also look at health access and access to social services. So here today, um, we have with us Mr. Julio Garcia from the organization PACO. And he will come to us and talk to you about some of the services that his agency has provided. And so here we are today with Mr. Julio Garcia from PACO. Welcome, Mr. Garcia. Thank Welcome to HealthBeat. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really uh, happy to be here with you today. Great. As you, you, you're from PACO, you're the executive director. Can you tell our viewers just a little bit about what PACO is, what PACO sure. stands for, and really some of the history behind the organization? Excited to be here and thank you for having me. I am the executive director of PACO, um, or Puerto Ricanos Asociados for Community Organization, better known as PACO. The history, PACO has really come a long way from a group of concerned Latinos, uh, predominantly Puerto Rican, who mm -hmm. saw an unmet need in the community, ranging from access to housing, um, trying to obtain a high school equivalency degree, a, a diploma, to um, learning English as a second language. Um, so now um, we are committed to that tradition of ensuring that we identify those gaps and those trends. Uh, and we do so today even with our programming. So for us, we are very proud that PACO has been here for 50 years mm -hmm. and we are excited to see what's to come. That's wonderful. Now, how long have you been with the organization? 
Wow. I have been with Paco now four years, uh, serving for four years, which seems like a lifetime ago <laughs> now, right? Um, and so in these four years, um, there's quite a bit of learning and adapting and ensuring that I do my part to ensure that the community obtains what it needs, just like our mission states. Mm -hmm. You know, we, for identifying success is very difficult, um, but whatever we could do, whatever I can do, uh, we're going to put our best foot forward to attain that. Now, for your services, what are some of the specific services that Paco is, is accessing and delivering to the community now? Sure. Well, just like our founders, um, our programs are focused to uh, focus on unmet needs for the low-income uh, families here in Jersey City. Uh, we do so by offering uh, two sets of, well, to, uh, a couple of key programs under mm -hmm. our community service department and our energy conservation department. Through the community service department, we offer a range of services serving our seniors. Through our senior services, we provide information referral, translation services, um, reassurance calls, uh, and quite a bit of community uh, programming, uh, socialization programming. Um, that is actually one of one of the things that makes me smile all the time. I love being a part of those, those activities. Um, and, and, and yes, also ensuring that our seniors uh, have access to key programming that is available to them. Mm -hmm. For our youth, we offer a summer, a summer arts program every summer. Uh, the program is in its going into its fourth year. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we, were, mm -hmm. we needed to postpone this summer. However, the program is growing. Uh, the, 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 the course offerings are, will be growing, and we're very excited to see what 2021 brings to the program. And our Can Do program, which is an informational referral service open to any Jersey City resident with questions and needing uh, the assistance of how to navigate municipal, state, and federal programming that's available to them. Um, and also offering translation services or anything that we may not be, uh, anything that a client needs, we try to identify the best resource or we refer them to one of our key partners here in the city and through the county or even the state. How large is your organization now? I'm sorry, let me go back because I forgot to mention the other key programs. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, and through our energy conservation department, uh, through our energy conservation department, we offer three key programs. One is our Hudson County led program, mm -hmm. which offers uh, the ability for us to uh, remediate any lead paint hazards in the home uh, and also to control or prevent elevated blood levels, lead blood levels in folks that may have been exposed. So our target, uh, um, our target is any home that was built before 1978 or that shows clear evidence of lead. So we try to do our best to educate not only the community but also remediate these issues in our city. Um, again, one of the other programs we offer is the weatherization program. The weatherization program is focused on making a home efficient so that way we reduce the burden of that utility cost bring. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do so by ensuring that we re replace, uh, replace or repair uh, boiler systems, uh, water tanks, uh, replace refrigerators, install carbon monoxide detectors or uh, smoke detectors, anything that will make the home more efficient, up to uh, replacing or repairing doors and windows as well. Um, so yeah, this is a, a great program using the most advanced technology to auditing a home and ensuring that the home will be efficient once we leave. Um, and our, our last program, which is we're widely known for, mm -hmm. is our Home Energy Assistance Program, uh, which is a utility service program and ensuring that during the, during the winter, we keep our families warm mm -hmm. and during the summer, we keep them cool. So Home Energy Assistance is our utility program um, and we offer uh, a one-time benefit on a yearly basis to offset the utility burden that someone may have. Uh, our goal through this program is to ensure that during the winter, mm -hmm. our families are warm, and during the summer, they stay cool. Uh, so these are just uh, just a quick breath of what we offer at PACO. And obviously, you know, as, as our commitment is, is to continue to identify the needs and identify programs and services that we can now bring to the community, hopefully, uh, as soon as possible. Question for you, Julio. Um, 
how would one access some of those services? Are there income guidelines that one must that you're following? Um, and what are some of your hours? Are you open in the evening? How sure. would one access? Sure. So yes, the details of income qualifications and how to qualify for any programs can be found on our website at www.pacoagency.org. Um, but yes, I think it's a great question about uh, access to our services. Unfortunately, due to the COVID pandemic, we had to adapt. Mm -hmm. right? Traditionally, our hours of operation are Monday through Fridays, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. However, mm -hmm. um, these hours and time frames are ever evolving and changing to ensure that we meet the needs and demands of the community. Um, we also partner very closely with PSCNG, offering our, pre our presence is always at payment centers in Journal Square. Mm -hmm. However, due to the pandemic, that has shifted. Uh, but we don't do this alone. We do this with key partners here in the city, and we created drop-off points. So uh, anyone that, that would like to complete a form, an application, they could drop it off in any of these drop-offs throughout the city. And all those, all those addresses and locations could be found on our website. I also encourage everyone to visit our social media, mm -hmm. our website, as we continuously post updates about our programming, the changes of our programs, new programs as, as we continue, um, and, and also any nuances that, that uh, the community is, it's important for the community to know. That's wonderful. I'm quite sure during this time of being the pandemic, you've seen an uptick in the, num the need for, yes. for your particular services. And how are you particularly meeting that need? Sure, um, it's interesting enough that I think our, our programs um, are always in need. However, uh, during this period, um, it's how to access us. Right. And, and I think that's been the key. Uh, what I could share is we are on the phone, we are, we are accessible via email. Uh, we introduced a new feature on our website to do live chatting so we could do live tech support over the phone just like many other, many other, other companies and businesses. Um, but we are trying our best to identify how can we create better access. Uh, we, we're not only a Jersey City organization, but we also service uh, um, to the entire county. Um, so our goal is to have partnerships across the entire city. Uh, and, and, and throughout the county. But here in Jersey City, we work with so many great people. Uh, and so that is one thing that folks have to keep attention on our website and our communications because uh, we, we update those regularly and we want to just make sure we are accessible and that folks don't have to go from one side of the city to the other just to get to us. So we are a phone call away, an email away, or just a simple chat away. Well, Julio, I would like to just say thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing at Paco. Thank you for the community work and all that you bring to the community. And thank you for coming on to Health Beats and sharing this with us. Thank, thank you. you. On behalf of my co-host, Sharnia Williams and myself, I especially want to thank you for watching. And on that note, we'll see you next time on Health Beats.